time start. Um, for the quiz part of things, you're supposed to have a quiz. So first question would be, uh, um, we know that ROP is all caused by oxygen. If we just crank the oxygen down, it'll go away. And there you are, true or false. Second question will be, screening's easy. Should be the intern's job or first year resident on the consult service. And there you are. And then the third question would be, I've heard that Abe Aston makes ROP go away. We should just inject them. They can be on their way and be done with it. And then the third or fourth issue would be that we've uh, uh, heard uh, that uh, you know, ROP is the same all over the world. We should apply the same screening criteria. Uh, there's no reason to really stress about making it different in different places. Um, and you could be thinking about those, and we'll talk about those questions later. Now, the topic for today is ROP. It's one of my favorite topics, and we're going to talk a little bit about what we know about it in the past from a historical standpoint, what we know about classifying it, which allows us to talk to each other about it, cause, treatment, and where things are in terms of ongoing research. Now, to put yourself in a historical perspective, in the 1940s, when the first epidemic of retrolental fibroplasia, as it was called then, occurred, the only instrument available to look at the fundus was the direct ophthalmoscope. It had been around since 19th century Germany, um, which is where it was developed. And good morning. And uh, this is the view that you might have at the bedside in this wave of blindness and relatively large in infants who've been exposed to large amounts of oxygen. What you're seeing, and the reason it was called RLF, is when you look at this, those are, it's a very miserable pointer, these new batteries, that's a retinal blood vessel. That's the retina against the back of the lens. This is what we would now call a stage five, totally detached, I'm not going to see retina. Hence the term retrolental fibroplasia <coughs> with the instrument of the day, the direct ophthalmoscope. And so it was a different time. Um, the issue then, once they figured out what was going on, was to cut back on the oxygen. Um, probably not your generation, but I went to school with a couple of kids who were lights out blind in both eyes uh, from RLF. They were part of that group. And um, now in the 40s, this was first described in the, took till the 50s with ongoing investigations looking at various possible causes, including fluctuations in temperature, background light, pH, oxygen. And once that was figured out, they cut back in the oxygen and said, well, this has gone the way of smallpox. Uh, you know, it's, it's going away and there you are. Um, but with advances in neonatal care, saving smaller and sicker infants, there was a need to use oxygen to prevent bad brain and heart and lung outcomes. On the other hand, cranking the oxygen up caused ROP to come back, RLF. And this got to a point in the 80s where it was a really pressing problem and there were a number of people interested in it around the world. They all got together um, in the about 1984 in a hotel room in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and came up with this international classification of ROP, uh, which allows us, again, to put things in a computer database. Teller acuity cards, uh, uh, Velma Dobson, who is a good friend of mine, passed away uh, from ALS a number of years ago, was Dr. Teller's graduate student. And Velma and Davida Teller developed these grading cards that is the source of all of the initial, up until kids could read an eye chart, if they could ever read an eye chart, uh, acuity information, outcome data, from all of the ROP studies. Um, and then following that, once we had a way to talk about it, um, came the question, what do we do about it? And that led to the first prospective randomized trial uh, which was the cryo-ROP study in 86. Now, that showed that if you 
intervene in a timely manner with cryotherapy, which was the only treatment modality that was generally available enough that you could do a big multi-center trial with it. The laser indirect ophthalmoscope had not been developed. The Japanese had taken kids and put them on a Mayo stand and used the xenon laser, which was delivered through a direct ophthalmoscope to look around and try to laser kids. And it didn't, I mean, it had some promising results, but as you can imagine, there was some significant <coughs> downsides to trying to do that, uh, one of which was the back injury to the individual who was trying to deliver the laser treatment in that awkward position. Um, and that led to these other studies that bring us up to where we are today where we've looked at, you know, does treatment help? Absolutely. It achieves about a 50% decrease in bad outcome. Can we do the same thing with laser? Every available study, as I'm going to tell you, would suggest that laser is as good or better than cryo. Less collateral damage, equivalent outcomes. Then, other questions to be answered included, if we intervene earlier for some kids, if we kind of change how we're delivering the care, can we get a better outcome? And that's what the early treatment study was about. The electronic, the EROP study, different, uh, you know, kind of tack on things. The question was, can we get reasonable information to make decisions about who needs to be looked at to be treated using photographs? A resounding yes with that, although it's not in general usage across the country. That gets us up to the present where we've got various aspects of if we inject a VEGF inhibitor inside the eye at a <coughs> appropriate time, can we reverse the changes of acute ROP? The answer to that is yes, but there are a lot of questions that remain to be answered, some of them that are being worked out, including some people that you know here, Dr. Hartnett and her lab looking at a lot of the issues going on you know, with ROP. Now, there were 7,000 kids blinded in the 40s in the U.S. in that initial epidemic where they figured out what was going on. Um, as recently as 1991, which if you look at the calendar, you can figure out that's after we were treating kids with cryo when it was appropriate, there were still about 650 kids across the U.S. that entered the blind school ranks. And it turns out if you want to know about blind children in a developed country, you look at the blind school population. If you want to know about severe vision loss, you can find out you know, how many there are that have been entered in that. We use that actually all over, but the data is less useful in some developing countries. Now, in 2001, there were still 44% unfavorable outcome in the kids who had cryotherapy at threshold. I mean, did it decrease the bad outcome? You bet it did. But is there still work to be done? Yes, and that's one of the kind of underlying themes I want to leave you with. Now, classification. If we're going to talk about ROP, we need to be able to go through and describe it. One of the questions I asked at the beginning here in our little quiz time, and I did try to put a quiz in and follow up to your wonderful lecture, the, uh, you, know, you know, what's the big deal? It's easy to do. Just send the intern. And for those of you who have done ROP exams with me, um, is it easy to do, to get in and get out and get a look at what you need to look at and be able to play the ROP game and find the nasal aura serrata and the temporal aura serrata in most infants safely? Do they ever try to die during the exam? Yes. Um, so no, it's not easy, um, but it is definitely worthwhile, and I would urge you all, I mean, one of my goals in your training here is to get you to a point where you can safely interact with the patients and the staff in the newborn ICU and get useful information from patients. Now, ICROP, this was arrived at again by a group like this sitting in a room saying, how do you want to describe this and what should we do? And they hammered this out. And there are three iterations of it. In 1984, the initial classification of stages and zones and plus disease. In 87, a description of the late stages, the various stages of retinal detachment, 4A, 4B, 5, open, closed funnel, things that may not matter greatly at times in terms of the visual outcome initially, 
but they're going to make huge differences when it comes to what sort of vitro rental interventions are going to occur and how easy it is to do them. And then in 2005, there was a revision uh, with some of the original authors, those that were still alive, um, that um, updated and added this issue of what we call aggressive posterior ROP. ROP in zone one, posterior zone two, that behaves differently. It's very active and leads to disaster if not dealt with very quickly. It's also unfortunately hard to see. When you look, you don't see the knee of vascularization. It's flat, it's on the surface of the retina and can be difficult to pick up. Um, the other thing we fine-tuned was how we describe plus disease, um, and those were the major things to come out of that. Now, location, staging, and severity are the ways we describe it. And if you look at this, if you make a draw a circle that the radius is twice the distance from optic nerve to fovea, everything inside there is zone one. By definition, there's no line in the eye. If you take the same eye, you draw a circle whose radius goes from optic nerve to the nasal aura serrata, and this is right eye and left eye as you're looking at them. Everything inside that, let me see if this will show up long enough to be <coughs> useful, and unfortunately, no. Um, everything outside zone one in that circle is zone two. The stuff that's left on the temporal side is zone three. Why is there that crescent temporally? Well, as you know from anatomy and embryology, the, the, you know, the, the optic nerve does not insert square in the middle of the back of the eye. It's off-centered nasally, so there's more temporal retina to vascularize. The vascularization is something that is kind of key in terms of ROP we'll come back to. Now, staging. Incomplete development of vessels, then stage one, stage two, stage three are the initial stages we talk about. Stage one, two, and three in terms of the active stages of ROP. With normal vascular development, you just see blood vessels stop. You see translucent, I don't yet have blood, ve uh, blood vessels retina beyond it. Stage one, there's a line at the end of normal vascular development. Stage two, you have a raised ridge. Stage three, you've got extra retinal neovascular tissue growing up over or on top of the ridge. Now, stage four, five are types of retinal detachment. And this is immature vascular development. Anytime you see something like radiologic studies, someone has taken the time to put arrows on, it's good to direct your attention there. Those arrows show where normal blood vessels stop and there is yet to be development of blood vessels. This whole process is driven by development of vascular endothelium in the cells that become vascular endothelial cells. Now, stage one ROP, you see that white line? Everybody see that? See the big blue arrows? That's stage one ROP. <coughs> and this is stage one, if you look right here, and you have to kind of look carefully, you'll see a line right there, and that is stage one ROP. And notice that it's not a straight line. When you see this come up here and go like this, this is because blood vessels fan out. They're not growing in a strictly linear fashion, and often you'll see curved arborization of vessels, and that line isn't a straight line like we draw it in the chart. Now stage two, this line now is a three-dimensional raised structure. And what you'll see here is, this is, now we're going to, this is some stage three ROP that's developed where you see the double arrows. There's extra retinal fiber proliferative tissue there. More aggressive there. And you'll notice that the blood vessels, the arteriolar vessels, in the venous vessels, the narrower vessels here, this is an arterial, this is a venous vessel. You'll see more dilation of venous vessels and tortuosity of arteriolar vessels. Those are the things that are harbingers of, I have active ROP, what we call plus disease. This is more aggressive stage three, and you could imagine 
as this structure contracts, it's going to pull the retina off. The detachments that occur in active, evolving ROP are almost always tractional detachments. And more stage three here, and notice that supertemporal vein you see there in that arcade, how dilated that is. That is definitely plus disease. This is very involved, stage three, with big dilated vessels. But when we're looking peripherally, you can't see anything about plus disease. The determination of plus disease is based on the appearance of vessels right around the optic nerve. And that's just by definition. And so going back historically, this is what we call threshold, I'm ready for treatment, where the thick white lines represent stage three. So if we had eight non-contiguous, not all linked together, clock hours of stage three, or five contiguous clock hours in this left eye, going from one o'clock to six o'clock, that would be threshold ROP. We don't use that anymore unless the patient actually gets there and bypasses our usual time of treatment, but useful to know about, and someone might ask you that on one of these uh, examinations that you have to take. Now, practical issues. Look at the posterior pole first before you mash on the eye because you can cause blood vessels to become dilated and precipitate what looks like plus disease just because of extended mashing on the eye with a scleral depressor. Look nasally first. If vessels go to the nasal aura, everything you see temporally is in zone three by definition. There's no line out there to tell you when zone two stops and zone three starts. So by definition, if vessels go to the nasal aura, the stuff on the temporal side is out in zone three. If on the other hand, things don't go to the nasal aura, then you know you are at least in zone two and if they're posterior enough, you could still be in zone one. Now, when you put the optic nerve at the nasal edge of a field with a 28 or a 30 diopter indirect lens, the, where the temporal edge is, is about the outer limit of zone one. Sometimes a useful thing, if you can see, if you can still see active ROP, when you've got that nasal, you've got the edge of the optic nerve at the nasal edge of the field, chances are you're looking at zone one ROP, which should cause you'd have a little bit of uh, angst um, about where things are headed. Now, for a partial detachment, fovea not involved, similar to adult regmatogenous detachments, if I have a detachment, my fovea is attached, you're gonna worry about getting things reattached because you think you can preserve vision, whereas if I come in and my fovea is detached, it's off, macula off, RD, and it's been that way, and I've got some PVR, chances are Mike Teske's gonna put me on the schedule sometime in the next few weeks, not tonight, right? And uh, after a trip somewhere, I'd say that. But, you know, there's a difference in the urgency and the likelihood of getting a good outcome. When you come in and you've got a MAC on, you know, detachment, the idea is to get the retina attached now so that you preserve good vision. And this patient right here, this is a 4A detachment. There is detachment of retina extending towards the fovea right there. And this is a schematic of a 4A detachment. You can see the fovea is still attached. And then 4B, this is the same patient a week later with the detachment extending right back to the optic nerve, and this is difficult. OCT has made it much more easy to kind of separate these because otherwise it can be very difficult to tell that the retina is detached there. Now, the retina can go on to become a fold as things contract, and as you can imagine, our ability to fix this and get a good outcome is pretty non-existent. So the name of the game is to prevent it. This is a 4B detachment, and then it doesn't matter to me, and it probably doesn't matter to the baby whether they have an open or a closed funnel. The retina is going to work just as badly. They may have light perception, some hand movement, moving around kind of vision, but it's going to matter to Eileen Wong greatly when she's trying to put vitrectomy probes in 
and worrying about what she's putting them through, and is she getting them into a space where they, she can then push retina back and then do retinotomies or whatever she has to do to try to get things reattached. This is a total exudate of retinal detachment. This was taken at the Moran Eye Center by Paula Morris, one of our photographers, with a Zeiss Fundus camera, with his baby on its side, um, we were holding the kid, on a mail stand, uh, brought the kid over to the old Moran, and that's where that picture was taken. And Paula was a pioneer in getting pictures of these kids, and so she participated in many of those photos that I showed you before. Um, and this is a total detachment looking down into the funnel, uh, the jaws of blindness, as it were. And this is that closing funnel, and this is where the retina is all watered up like a piece of chewing gum, uh, as one of my mentors used to describe it, and, and it's not very easy to get that fixed. So we don't want it to get there. Now, severity plus disease. Posterior pole, venous dilatation, arterial or tortuosity, and with this latest iteration of ICROP, instead of leaving it vague, came up with the idea that you've got two quadrants, thinking about the four vascular arcades, two quadrants or more involved to call a plus disease. This is still the sticking point for most people who do work with ROP day in and day out in describing whether there is plus disease or not. And this is where all the impetus for Michael Chang and his work on trying to use computer assessment of dilation and tortuosity. Still not at the point of uh, you know general uh, uh, utility, but it will be. This is plus disease. Big dilated veins, tortuous arterial or vessels, and this is also plus disease with very active stage three, and this is an eye that if we treat, again, we can save vision. This is very fulminant plus disease, and now pre-plus disease. What about that? That was also added. And that's, I'm almost plus, but not quite. And that's really all it means. And it's a judgment call. And this is pre-plus disease. You've got dilation, tortuosity, not enough to call it plus, not normal enough to call it normal. An aggressive posterior ROP. Zone one, very posterior zone two. When you see active ROP there, you need to get the 20 diopter lens out and look carefully to see if you see neovascular tissue, which can be flat. In some kids, even doing fluorescein angiography at bedside, which you can do with the camera that we have if they have IV access, is a possibility, and people have done that in the NICU. Uh, we don't do it here regularly. Uh, prominent plus disease, and again, the retina, the active ROP can be very difficult to see. And if you look where the blue arrows are, there is flat neovascularization on the retina, both of those areas. But when you first glance at that, you would say, well, there might be some stage one ROP, let's not worry about that, we'll look at this kid in a week, and this is a kid that needs to be treated. This is a, a child that we saw here at the University of Utah with fulminant posterior you know, vessel dilation, look at how big those, those vessels are, and 360 degree flat neovascularization in zone one. The difference with cryo is that almost 100% of these eyes, with or without treatment, had bad outcomes. Part of it was we treated so much of the eye with cryo, the eyes didn't survive the treatment. And this is a close up. Now, regression. This is the most common thing that happens with ROP. This means that it gets to a certain point and then it gets better, but often there are things left behind. Areas of peripheral avascularity, abnormal branching, pig pig pigmentary changes, and the one that's probably the most worrisome to me are these vitreo retinal interface changes, because that is where later in life, when the vitreous becomes mobile, you'll have traction on the retina. That's a place where you're going to develop retinal tears, and if you follow kids, who've had severe ROP that were lucky enough not to have a disastrous outcome initially, there is a trickle of kids as time goes on who have what are called late retinal detachments due to those changes. And this is a, a, a patient who has had three successive areas that you can see where they had ridges develop and then get better and you see blood vessels growing out right here 
down through this and in, in the retina. And so vascularization to some extent has continued, but not normally. If you see that third ridge, there are no blood vessels that go beyond that. And here you can see where there was a ridge and vessels are clearly going beyond it. But again, the vessels don't have a quite normal appearance. Here what we're seeing is an area where the changes that drive vascular endothelial development become fibroblasts, lay down collagen, cause scar to form that contracts and then pulls the retina so that this are, these arcades that were once way out here are now pulled together and pulled in this direction and that results, first of all, in distortion of the normal architecture in the foveal area. So instantly, your chance of having wonderful vision goes out the window. And a lot of these eyes will go on to develop total detachments over time. Now, straightening of temporal vessels, ectopic, ectopic fovea, dragging of the retina, the thing that causes us to have a positive angle kappa, an eye that looks like it's turned out because the fovea has been pulled temporally. Uh, retinal folds and late detachments are all things to worry about, and these are, you see those straightened vessels in that supratemporal <coughs> arcade in this right eye? That's what we're talking about there. <coughs> this is a fold. Now, threshold we talked about already, and we're not going to dwell on that because there's a new deal, as it were. And this was based on the early treatment of ROP study, ETROP. And what we did is retrofit the data to come up with this scheme that appeared to mimic what we would have accomplished if we made everybody run around in the NICU and you all had a, an app on your phone that you had to enter all kinds of data in on each kid and decide are they at high risk or not at high risk. And this seemed to be a lot simpler and easier to apply. So the idea with this is that type 1 ROP is ROP, if you've got any ROP with plus disease in zone 1, <coughs> if you've got stage 3, whether you have plus or not, or out in zone 2 if you have any stage 2 or 3 with plus disease. So if you think about what I said about threshold, you've got 5 contiguous or 8 non-contiguous clock hours. We sat and waited for a lot of kids to develop enough stage 3 or plus disease to say it was time to treat. And what we're saying with this is if you've got one clock hour of stage 3 and you've got plus disease, we treat. Type 1 ROP, we treat. And type 2, this is I'm almost ready, we're going to worry about you, but we're not going to treat you today. And this is stage one or two without plus disease in zone one, so we can have a little bit of ROP in zone one and watch it. Zone two, and this is the most common scenario, we've got some stage three, but we don't have plus disease in zone two. And all of you that have seen kids with me doing ROP exams know we've seen kids where we've got a little bit of stage three, <clears throat> we're not calling it plus disease, and we say, well, let's come back in a week. So this is a common scenario for this type 2 ROP. So treat type 1, or if they progress to threshold, you look in and last week they had incomplete vessels, and this week they've got eight you know, non-contiguous clock hours of stage 3 with plus disease. By all means, you treat them. They've gone past this type 1 thing. And again, the reason this was decided upon was we thought myself among those who were worrying about this, that there were kids where we waited till they had enough stage three to treat, or waited till they had plus disease, where we would have gotten a better outcome, and they went on to bad outcomes, some of those kids. And that's what drove this. Now, what do we know about etiology? Normal vascular development begins at the optic nerve at about four months gestation. It reaches the aura serrata asymmetrically, nasally at about eight months in a term infant, temporally nine months in a term infant. But once you develop ROP, those things go out the window. You can't count on a kid who's in the NICU who has got you know, ROP and they say, well, by they're, they're, they should be term now, they should be completed. And that isn't how it works, unfortunately. 
the, that timetable goes right out the window. Now, vascular precursors come from the hyaloid system. What else do we think about the hyaloid system from, for? What other vascular developmental abnormality in the eye? Yeah, PFV. Remember, it's the hyaloid blood vessels, that primary blood vessel system that comes forward and when the lens placoid separates from surface ectoderm, provides nutrition to the developing lens, then it's supposed to go away. Some of the cells that were involved in forming the hyaloid system are the cells that are the precursors of the endothelial cells that drive retinal vascular development. And the, these, what they call vanguard and rear guard cells, the vanguard are the spindle cells that are driving the process and then they morph into endothelial cells, the rear guard cells. And I'm not big on past slides, um, I'm not a pathologist, but going from your left to right, you see vanguard cells going to the right, rear guard cells trying to organize into a vascular channel. On the other hand, this process has gone awry in this infant, and this is extra retinal neovascular tissue, and, and realize that, I mean, the reason we have this slide is that this infant um, had an unfortunate outcome in terms of prematurity in general. Um, this is another autopsy specimen that shows first the extra retinal fibroproliferative tissue here, and you can clearly see traction on the retina in the vitreous. This is a stage five, I'm totally detached retina. Now, what about oxygen? Back in the 50s, Arnold Patz, Dr. Kinsey, John Flynn, who just passed away um, during the last year, um, and uh, Helen Hittner uh, more recently have driven this whole idea that oxygen is the culprit in some version of what's happening with oxygen, oxygen metabolism. Initially, uh, oxygen was cut back. They thought it had gone away. Um, Dr. Hittner has been the main mover and shaker talking about oxidative damage initially and all of the events that led to using VEGF inhibitors. A lot were driven by her relentless enthusiasm for pushing this agenda, and we have a lot to you know, big vote of thanks to her for doing that because there were a lot of people that were saying bad things about her when that was all going on and with the beat rock study and things that have come out of that, she's pretty much been vindicated. Um, people looked initially at vitamin E, ACTH, ambient light, surfactant. With uh, vitamin E, it turns out if you give kids high doses of vitamin E, it doesn't decrease ROP, it does increase the incidence of necrotizing uh, enterocolitis, sepsis, and death. Um, so that was not pursued. Um, there was the, the light ROP study looking at ambient light uh, levels. Again, that local story, we were not part of that study. Our neonatologists uh, elected not to support us in participating in it, but Christina Plass, one of our nurses in the NICU here, and Susan Bracken, my uh, original um, study coordinator developed the goggles they used in that study. So that part of that was developed here at the University of Utah. The idea was if you cut down on ambient light using neutral density filters, do you decrease the incidence of active and aggressive ROP? And the answer to that, based on the best available information, is no, you don't. I thought when surfactant came out, they were going to be able to you know, get better pulmonary outcomes, better systemic outcomes, and that we're all going to be able to do other things and not deal with ROP. Unfortunately, what it did instead is it allowed them to save smaller, sicker kids who went on to have worse ROP. So I, I didn't see that one coming. Now, current thinking is that we've got ischemic retina, local tissue hypoxia, production of VEGF. So it's production of things that are produced in the face of hypo tissue hypoxia that drive active ROP. And VEGF-mediated events include this endothelial cell replication, vascular overgrowth, extra-retinal proliferation, and lack of planned cell death, it's apoptosis. Uh, the various, all of these uh, uh, growth factors have been implicated and have been looked at in one way or another in studies and you will hear a lot more about that aspect of things in your practice careers. Leah Owens 
research career is built around looking at epigenetic phenomena that may be associated with ROP and related vascular diseases that affect infants. Now, from natural history, the significance of this, if you stratify kids into these birth weight ranges, under 750 grams, 750 to 1,000, 1,000 to 1,250, notice that the incidence of ROP goes way up the smaller you are at birth. The incidence of threshold ROP goes from 2% to 15% if you look at those same birth weight strata. And other significant factors, race being non-Caucasian was protective against developing threshold ROP. Clearly, the events based on the cryo-ROP study data of active ROP are related to post-conceptual age, not chronologic age from birth. And that allowed us to change the screening criteria so we weren't looking at kids at 26, 27 weeks of age. If they're born at 23 weeks of age, we waited until, based on their post-conceptual age, we thought they were at risk because looking at a 26-week gestation infant and doing an ROP exam um, is fraught with apnea, bradycardia, and bad things happening. Um, the other issue is if you were born in the hospital where you received your ROP care, you did better than if you were born elsewhere and transported in. Now, screening exams, Currently, we look at all kids under 1,500 grams or born less at 28 or, or less weeks gestation at birth, and we look either at four to six weeks or we stall it to 31 to 33 weeks if that occurs later. Um, and that, that helps us not doing what I term fetus exams on these very, very small infants that were hard on the babies, really hard on me and didn't really add to the infant's care. We were just doing it because we said we ought to. This has all been published, again, if you're interested in looking at it, both the American Academy of Pediatrics, Journal of Pediatrics, um, APOS, and the AAO came out with a joint statement back in 96 talking about changing these criteria. And, and so timing of exams, and again, this data, as far as timing of the exams, was fine-tuned based on that early treatment of ROP study data. And um, so if they're less than 28 weeks, we examine at 31 weeks. We stall it till then. If they're later than 28 weeks at birth, we wait and we look four to six weeks down the road. And then the follow-up exams are based on what we saw on the exam today. If we think they are still at risk of going to type 1 ROP needing treatment, we see them weekly until they're not and then we spread things out. Now, new additions. And when I was in your shoes, the reason I asked the question initially about shouldn't the intern do this, it turns out that that was indeed, at the University of Michigan, the case when I was a resident. All ROP screening was done by residents. They were never seen by a faculty member, and the reason for that was there wasn't a darn thing you could do to change things. And so what we did is we identified kids that needed to be referred to the blind school. And that was all that came of those exams, and that was very unfortunate, and it got my attention in a big way. But exams were scheduled. If somebody thought about it, when I came back to, to Salt Lake, <coughs> if the neonatologist said, I think we should have this kid looked at to see if they have ROP, that was the way things were done. And it wasn't until uh, much later that the idea that we need to look at babies as they come into the NICU and say, this baby needs to be looked at on this date. That's what happens now. And we now have our, uh, uh, um, you know, Melissa Chandler, our first ROP coordinator. And she is going to put all these kids in a database, and we can follow them forever. We'll know where they are. It's going to be really <coughs> cool. Now, what else do we need to talk about with this? For most infants, you look twice. Why? Well, if I look today and I was in a hurry or I didn't get quite the look I should and I thought things were out in the zone three, but I look a week or two from now and I see, gosh, we're still in mid zone two. Does that happen? You bet it does. And so to avoid missing that child going on to needing treatment, each child who is at risk initially should be looked at at least twice. And then 
what I just mentioned about when we follow the kids, that's one issue. The other issue is that let's say we're seeing a child here at the university today. That child is being transported to Pioneer Valley Hospital because they have a NICU and the parents want to be close to home. They couldn't possibly drive all the way to the university. We need to arrange follow-up. We need to hand off that baby's care to somebody that's going to see him, or one of us, that might be me, has to jump in a car and run there and see that kid when they need to be seen. And have people been successfully sued for not handing off that care? You bet. Um, and those have been, um, you know, in the tune of one of my colleagues being sued for $67 million. And even though that was ultimately dismissed, having that hang over her head for the two years it took to work through the courts absolutely ruined her life during that period. And she still to this day will not do ROP exams, won't participate in it, will have nothing to do with it because of that experience. It was awful for her. The other thing to do is to communicate with the parents. <coughs> One of Mel's jobs is going to be to interact with the parents, to educate them. Um, and actually, as we're sitting here, my daughter, who was a NICU nurse at primary, is interviewing for a position to be the um, parent educator um, to talk about things like ROP with parents in the NICU. So the NICU takes it seriously on their end as well. And there's a consensus statement in 2001, again, by all of our organizations uh, published in various places, uh, that deals with this issue of uh, needing to coordinate things to hand patients off and, and partly this was driven by the need to let people know that people are being held accountable for it. But bottom line is, these are important things to do, not just threat a lawsuit. Um, you know, if we were worried terribly here about lawsuits, I mean, we have huge medical legal exposure just doing our OP, but I'm committed to seeing these babies because I think it's an important thing to do. We can help them, and that's why we all went into medicine. Now, what about long-term follow-up? It turns out that kids who've had ROP are more at risk for very high myopia. Kids who have had significant intraventricular bleeding are kids who develop CP. They have central vision loss due to damage to the optic radiations as they wrap around the posterior part of the lateral ventricles. When you talk about grade three and grade four intraventricular hemorrhage, you're talking about damage to those brain tissues, things that you can see on an MRI scan now, can you lose a lot of those pathways and still have pretty darn normal vision? Yes, uh, but it means it, you and I need to worry about it, follow that child till they're an age that we can settle that to make sure that they're seeing well enough to get the education that they deserve. Uh, retinal outcomes, uh, as far as late detachments, visual field loss, uh, those are all issues that need to be looked at and then developmental delay, which makes it at times very difficult to examine these kids, but it is worthwhile. Now, what about developing world applications? One of the questions I asked at the beginning of the quiz was, you know, ROP is the same. I mean, they make infants the same in Thailand as they do here or in Bhutan, so what's the big deal and why should we worry about changing things? The issue is the quality of neonatal care. There may be genetic differences as well with infants that are born at high altitude in Nepal and Bhutan. Separate discussion, but the big issue here is the standardization, the lack of oxygen blenders. I personally smuggled oxygen blenders into Bhutan because their neonatologist could not get them. The health service in the country wouldn't get them. And she, <coughs> having trained in Japan, knew that if she could control the oxygen saturations better, she could get better outcomes and they'd have fewer blind kids, which wasn't a big issue until they started having blind kids, which they do have a trickle of now every year. Um, so the issue here is that these screening criteria, because of this and because ROP occurs in kids who are born later, post-conceptual age, and at a larger birth weight, getting bad ROP and winding up with poor visual outcomes in developing countries, the local criteria need to be adjusted. We also have an obligation to work with our pediatrics and neonatology colleagues to kind of let them know that we need to kind of grow that whole system together 
and hopefully provide better neonatal care and enable them to get oxygen blenders and, and, and have trained neonatologists. And this shows, and this is a busy slide, but this is birth weight at the top and post-conceptual age at the bottom. If you look at where, you'll see kids there that are over 3,000 grams <coughs> in Argentina. Um, you know, there are, getting threshold ROP. You know, there are, these are kids that, that need to be attended to. Right now, the Pan American Association for Ophthalmology recommends all kids in Latin America 1,700 grams or less. Not in our, we don't see ROP here in kids over about 1,250, almost ever. But they're, they're another almost 500 grams heavier in terms of the kids that they're screening because of their local experiences. Clara Gil Gilbert, who was the author in that paper, is uh, uh, an ophthalmologist in the UK. Um, she has been instrumental in almost everything that's happened of note in international developing world ROP for the last 20 years. Uh, if you get a chance to meet her, she's wonderful. And um, she doesn't get a lot of credit for a lot of the stuff that she does, but she's been a major force. She and my colleague, Graham Quinn, at uh, CHOP. Um, there are evolving epidemics in the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. There was a huge meeting in South Africa a year ago this past fall, the focus of which was to get ophthalmologists, pediatric uh, ophthalmologists, retina specialists, actively engaged in looking at ROP and setting up screening and treatment programs. I've been involved in helping the programs in Ghana and in Ethiopia get their start in this. Um, and then, so we've talked about, now what about management? What do we do? We've talked about these issues before and we're going to do the best we can in terms of oxygen management and they keep trying to fine tune this uh, and you'll hear more about it but kids will still get to a point where we need to intervene and do corrective things. <clears throat> Cryotherapy remains the only type of treatment that has been shown in a prospective multi-center randomized control treatment group in ROP. And the reason for that is it's no longer ethical to randomize a child to no treatment. You can't do it. So subsequent studies show, you know, compare cryo to laser and various, and all of the VEGF studies basically have compared VEGF inhibitor injections to the current gold standard, which is laser treatment. Now, when you do cryotherapy, you have to keep in mind that you're putting a cryoprobe on conjunctiva, and you're freezing full thickness through conjunctiva, sclera, muscle, choroid, all these tissues to get to the retina, where you're trying to destroy retina. Why are you trying to destroy retina? Because that ischemic retina that you're trying to destroy is what's driving the production of VEGF and all these VEGF-mediated events that cause active ROP. But in the process, you have all this collateral damage. When we treated kids with cryo, you couldn't even see the eyes for two or three days. They were so massively swollen. It required general anesthesia. In our study center for cryo-ROP, we had one cardiac arrest during treatment due to an overly aggressive treatment by a retina surgeon <coughs> uh, in the community that I had be one of our, our treaters. Um, that child did survive the arrest, but it was... Uh, uh, a real scary moment for me when I got that phone call in clinic and had to go run into the NICU to help sort things out. Um, they wanted us to stop the study. And I had to do a lot of talking to keep going with it uh, because I was convinced that it was going to help. It turns out I was right. Um, that we've talked about. This shows cryoburns, and this is the stage 3 ROP down below in the avascular peripheral retina that has been treated with confluent <coughs> trial burns. And, and we randomized 4,000 infants under 1251 grams <coughs> of weight. 291 of them were randomized to either treatment or control. One eye treated, one eye controlled, um, even if they had symmetric disease in the two eyes. And then results were to, you know, described at various intervals up to 15 years of age. And Basically, this showed that, yes, it's safe and effective. We learned a lot about epidemiology and, and natural history. 
And also out of this came timing of screened exams linked to post-conceptual age, which I think is key in terms of not picking on kids too early and doing unnecessary exams. <clears throat> and if you look, and I'm just going to flip through these, both at, at three months the outcomes were so striking that the Data Safety and Monitoring Committee said you can no longer randomize any child to control, which was really cool. The um, results showed about a 50% decrease in both bad structural and functional outcomes as you go through all of these studies, realizing we're getting better data as kids get older and those who can read acuity charts rather than look at the teller cards because you can overestimate acuity with those teller cards. And so now what about contrast sensitivity? It turns out that compared to no ROP, hang on a second, um, the treated kids were about half normal, uh, half of them were in the normal range, and the control group, if I had bad ROP but I didn't get treated or wasn't quite ready for treatment, <clears throat> those kids had poorer outcomes in terms of contrast sensitivity. So it did not appear, one of the questions was, would we hurt contrast sensitivity by doing treatment? The answer to that is no. The other thing was visual fields. When we first started using cryo, I told parents in our study center that there was a very good chance that those kids would have very, very poor peripheral vision. They may not drive, they may have trouble getting around, but their straight ahead vision should be good. And it turns out that what you lose is you lose about a third of your visual field due to, I've had severe ROP. And you lose a little bit more um, just, uh, uh, you know, if you've had treatment. Um, and that's about a 5% reduction. And it turns out that the eyes that, that had treatment overall did better than those that stuck through that had severe ROP didn't get treated. So the amount of visual field loss is not as significant as we thought it was going to be. And in fact, most of it has to do with some of those changes in the peripheral retina due to having severe ROP, not to the treatment itself. And then at 15 years, we've still got very significant improved structural and acuity outcomes. Now, I mentioned before, new folds, detachment, bad things happening. It occurred less in treated eyes than in control eyes. Well, what I do now with all kids who've had severe RLP is I tell their parents that they have to have an eye exam by somebody who knows what they're looking at once a year for life. And I tell them that when I see them back their first visit to the clinic after they leave the NICU because there's a lot of stuff going on that's dropped on them when they're in the NICU and they're not going to remember a lot of what you tell them. What about laser treatment? These were the initial studies and they showed excellent regression of ROP. I remember, still remember the first kid that I had Mike Teske treat here with zone 1 ROP with laser. And that kid as opposed to the cryo kids where the eyes just gave up and became tricycle, had attached retina and looked wonderful. Now it did take the kid two years because of the bad brain outcome he had from prematurity to act like he saw anything. But for me, this was a game changer uh, for the posterior, very posterior involvement kids, what we now call aggressive posterior ROP. <coughs> we could treat them with laser the retina was attached, and if their brain had the capacity of doing it, they could see. And these are photos that I took with a handheld film fundus camera um, as we were treating a kid. Those are laser spots. That's the plus disease that you're seeing down below. And again, you see a little bit of hemorrhage. Laser may have been a little close to the ridge right there, um, but that's what the view looked like. And so we're holding the fundus camera, kind of doing this, trying to get those pictures. Um, and this, these studies compared uh, laser to cryo, and still going through that. And then these studies looked at laser treatment in zone one, and again, supported what I just mentioned to you. And then vitro retinal surgery. Bottom line is that yes, they can get the retina reattached, but it doesn't work like it was intended to 
in almost all circumstances. Can those kids function better and are the eyes happier with the retina attached? You bet they are. And again, scleral buckling. So we wind up, realize the good outcome here is 2300 or better. Okay, that's not what we're shooting for. Um, and so for vitrectomies, again, you'll find anatomic success rates vary a lot, but Graham Quinn's paper in ophthalmology in 1991 looking at the visual outcomes would suggest that very few of these eyes, if you compare groups of I had no surgery to I had aggressive vitreoretinal surgery, actually saw better. Now, Pat Drosty, who's one of my pediatric ophthalmology colleagues, and Mike Tracy, the guy who trained Mike Teske in Detroit, uh, looked at this visual function battery. The question of if I put a chair in the middle of the room and ask the child to come over and pick up a Twinkie on the floor, uh, do they walk around the chair? Things that are of practical significance. Can they navigate in unfamiliar surroundings? And kids with vitreoretinal retinal surgery, attached, partially attached retinas that are deemed stable, did better. And it's time to kind of wrap things up here. But we are, you know, if you look at kids over time, they have increased need for vitrectomy, lens acrobismus <coughs> surgery, and shunts, keeping in mind the neural, you know, surgery outcome, the I have, you know, bad hydrocephalus, obstructive hydrocephalus due to my intraventricular bleeding. And then what about VEGF inhibitors? These are used in a variety of pediatric vitreoretinal diseases, and you'll see Dr. Hartnett and Dr. Wong both using uh, uh, them in various forms in these uh, diseases. And there were initial clinical reports of using this back in about 2008, um, and it looked like there were initial good responses that were reported. Um, and Dr. Hittner, her initial report was in retina in 2009, uh, about, I think, 11 patients that had stage 3 ROP, posterior ROP, and looked like she had good outcomes. And then the beat ROP study, which was published in the New England Journal in February 2011, looked at 150 infants. I want you to notice the 0 .625 milligram dose. That was just pulled out of the air because that's what we use in adults with AMD. So you're taking a child that's this big, and you're taking somebody that's my size and age, and you're injecting the same in that infant as you would in, in me. That's changed, but that's where we started with this. And even with that, though, they found a decrease of recurrence of ROP. That was their outcome. Does ROP come back um, in zone one disease? More normal vascularization and less myopia. And so what have we learned? And I'll close here. VEGF inhibitors do work. Um, the minimal effective dose has not been firmly established. The ROP1 study, where one of the study centers for it, uh, uh, done by the PEDIC group, um, dose de-escalation, decreased dose. Every time we find a dose that appears to work for everybody, we go down. And they're down now, as far as published data, to 1 20th of the dose that's used in adults for AMD, and it still appears to work. And uh, um, why are we concerned about that? Well, it turns out that VEGF is important in developing vascular beds in all sorts of organ systems in a neonate. And can you measure it systemically? Does it get suppressed systemically with this intraocular injection? You bet it does. And, and so people are tinkering with dosing, with using different VEGF inhibitors, and that is something that uh, this dosing trial that we're part of and the rainbow study, which we're also part of, uh, comparing Avastin to Lucentis, you'll hear more coming out about that. This is going to evolve in your practice careers. Now back to our, our quiz. So should it be just the intern doing ROP screening? The answer to that is obviously no. Um, and why don't we just cut the oxygen back? It worked in the 50s. Increased death. That's right. Now, every time, you know, every time you cut back the oxygen to save vision, you've got the other side of that teeter totter are increased deaths from bad neurologic, cardiovascular, and pulmonary outcomes. And so, 
you have to juggle those things, and, and this is a you know, kind of a teamwork situation. Um, questions? The high myopia, and it isn't just later in life, these are kids that may be minus 15 or minus 20 at six months of age, or nine months of age. And so the, 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 the feeling there is there's something about the abnormalities in the peripheral retina that are driving that, um, but the exact mechanism of it has not been worked out. Nobody knows, these are not, I mean, it's clearly different than the kids who have a highly myopic, you know, mom and dad and have recessively inherited pathologic high myopia. Um, they show up being myopic, usually in their preschool years, early school years, but these are kids that, you know, we sometimes have in glasses at six or nine months of age because they can't see from themselves to a parent. Um, but the mechanism of it, isn't well worked out. The results of some of the VEGF, I mean, one of the proposed advantages of VEGF inhibitors is that you have less high myopia, and the studies would indeed suggest that that is the case. That will turn out to be a huge advantage. Why treating it effectively with VEGF inhibitor versus treating it effectively with laser would have that much difference, because that's what they're comparing are the laser outcomes versus the VEGF inhibitor outcomes. And um, so that is yet, yet to be worked out. The other thing that's yet to be worked out is where the kids, because commonly now we'll have a child, and I know all of you have done with Nikki with us, where we, we see a kid who's had VEGF inhibitor injection. Acute ROP's gone away. But as that's gone away, <coughs> what's happened is that we're worried about it coming back. The recurrence is a big issue. And if that kid is being back transported to somewhere on the Navajo reservation, we may well laser that kid. So then you're muddying the water because they've had both VEGF inhibitor and they've had laser. And how that's gonna shake out in large scale fashion is still to be worked out as well. But now when you figure that one out, um, you'll, uh, you'll be famous and it'll be a big paper. Um, but I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know that anybody does exactly. Other questions about ROP? So I think that this is something that, you know, if you're interested in it, please uh, stay involved in it. Um, don't be too worried about, you know, you hear all the scary medical legal things, but um, to date, uh, knock on wood, I have uh, not been involved in any medical legal action that has to do with ROP, you know, ever. Um, and we see a lot of kids here you know, I think it's rewarding, it's fun to do. Um, what else did we have on our quiz? What other questions were there? Anybody remember? We talked about the developing country thing. We talked about the need to not just cut back the oxygen, not just have the, uh, the infant do it. It is, it is tedious and it is somewhat difficult to learn to do it well. But I, I, you know, my goal, and this really is that, let's say you're doing comprehensive ophthalmology, you know, in the Uwena Basin, and we send a child home, and you look at the child, I want you to feel comfortable knowing that if there were something bad going on, you may not see the entire extent of the retina, you'd be able to sort out, I'm doing okay from I need to hot foot it back to Salt Lake to have something done, and, and that, <coughs> You know, beyond that, if you're going to do something with it, you will do it regularly. It will become a lot easier for you. It's never really easy, um, and bad things do happen in the NICU. Um, that's why we, you know, we try to stay up on things. And and the other, you know, question is what role will cameras play? And am I going to be re replaced by a camera and somebody at a remote center, uh, um, you know, looking at the photos? It turns out that's what we did in that early, you know, the electronic RLP studies. We had a central reading center, but to the best of my knowledge, no one is using that central reading center. Even the folks who were most hot about it, the folks at my buddy Graham Quinn and Gil Binnebaum at, at CHOMP, uh, they're still, if they're taking photos, they're doing the same thing that we do. They take photos to document things. 
So many centers do that. And we take photos here. Every baby we do an RLP exam on every visit so that if someone has a question about it, we can go back and look at it as a group. It also allows for good communication between the screeners and the treaters where they can look at the same photo and come to some consensus and hopefully about what's going on. Thanks for your attention. Get on with your day and uh, Happy New Year.